Today I'm going to talk about an integral that I've calculated before in one of my previous videos and I will place a link in the description to, uh, for you to take a look at that also. Um, in that previous video I calculated this integral here in a fairly straightforward conventional way so to say. In this video I'm going to take the same integral and I'm going to calculate it in a much weirder way and a somewhat non-logical way but it gives you a really good insight in how to work with contours. So for this video I'm going to take two contours, a G1 contour and a G2 contour with different cuts. There is a cut here at phi equals one quarter pi and here there's a cut with phi is min minus three fourth pi. And I also take in this, uh, so this is the integral we're going to calculate. But if we move this to the complex plane, I'm doing a wick rotation and I'm looking at a slightly different function that I'm going to evaluate. And what we will see is that we will end up at the same equation here. The interesting one, right? The one we're interested in and want to calculate. So here you see x squared plus 1 on the real axis, but I kind of wick transferred it in uh, with the 90 degrees and you get c squared minus 1 instead of plus 1 here. So that's the function I will use to calculate with the residue theorem, which is described here. I'm going to calculate the value of this, uh, this integral. Since we are running the contour here on top of poles here, this, it's running over this pole and it's running over this pole on G2 here. The residue uh, theorem is slightly different from the conventional one. In our previous video, the residue video was, uh, was the residue was stated 2 pi i, the residue of FC. And that's because all the residues kind of fit into uh, the contour that I calculated. But if you go over one of the residues here, then you have to, instead of use 2 pi i, you have to use pi i. So that's what, what I'm using here. So the residue theorem here is the contour integral of a complex analytic function fcdz over a closed contour equals 2 pi i times the residues of fc that are inside and plus pi i the time of the amount of residues, the sum of the residues that are on the contour. Okay. So that's what we will use here in this video. Uh, SP4, the residue is defined as such. Uh, and we will see how to use this one. And we're also going to use C to the alpha, which is E to the alpha log C plus I arc C. And again, we're only going to look at uh, main branches, uh, which means that K equals zero. Okay, let's see how the, the angles run in the system. So if you look at this top contour, the angles go from 0 to pi over 4 over here. Then they jump to minus 1 3 quarters pi. So this is all negative, 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 negative. And then it goes back to 0 over here. Yeah, that's the top contour. If you look at the bottom, it's running a little bit different. It's running negative from 0 to minus 3 fourths of uh, pi here. Then it jumps to 1 1 and a quarter pi. And then it goes back to 0. So these are all positive angles. And these are all negative angles. So here you have i pi over 2 on this L3 uh, path. Okay. But because you have uh, the cut here, you have minus 3, 2 pi on the L1 path over here. Right. So this is minus 3, 2 pi. This is plus uh, pi over 2 here. So keep that in mind. So with L1, as I stated, you have minus 3, 2 pi i times x. When you go over this path, that is what z is at that path, right? And then L3, on L3 you have e to the pi over 2 times i times x, okay? Because there it's positive uh, pi over 2. So that is what z is on that path. And as I stated before, fc equals c to the alpha minus 1 over c squared minus 1 instead of plus 1, the integral we're interested in. But we will see that it works out because you are at i pi over 2 here. 
that means that there's another minus introduced here and you get x squared plus one as a result okay um, I think that those are the most important things so let's start with calculating what we have here and we'll start on g1 which is the top one so let's calculate that first that's build up out of four different uh, curves that's l1 that's cr then you go on l2 here and then you go on c epsilon right so you go on l2 and then you go on c epsilon as before in the other calculation we can say for ce the small curve let's start with a small circle here we can say it's epsilon e to the power i phi over here and you can fill that out in fc and once you do that you can see that you get an e to the alpha minus one e i phi of times alpha minus one over e epsilon squared e to the two i phi minus one times d epsilon e i phi and now let's see if we can take the limit uh, to it uh, ep there's an epsilon here there's an epsilon minus one here so you get e to the power alpha divided by e squared or epsilon squared here okay so if as long as epsilon is bigger than zero this will go to zero provided that that obviously this integral does exist and is continuous so you can exchange limits and integrals um, but that's the case so as long as alpha is bigger than zero here if epsilon goes to zero this integral goes to zero okay so this one disappears the same for the big curve here you fill it out in a similar fashion it's exactly the same except for uh, epsilon has been replaced by r here and now r goes to infinity so again this r will cancel that r so there's r to the power of alpha over r squared so it better be that alpha is smaller than 2 because if it isn't if r goes to infinity this integral will not exist so alpha needs to be smaller than 2 that's the reason why this integral only exists between alpha is bigger than 0 and alpha is smaller than 2 okay so if that's the case then this is piece is also 0 right so now let's focus on l1 and l2 so g1 we have the l1 integral and we have the l2 integral okay so let's keep that uh, at rest for now and let's now look at g2 because what we're going to do is we're going to add these two up and if we do that certain things will fill, uh, disappear so for g2 we also have l4 cr again plus l3 here plus ce over here and obviously these two again go to zero so the only thing you're left with is l3 that part plus l4 that part now if we look at angles over here here the angles are zero as i stated before it's zero it goes all the way up to pi over four then it jumps minus two pi so you get minus one three quarters pi this is minus three two pi right and here you have plus i uh, plus pi over two as an angle here on the other end it's still zero so you have an integral here that goes from r to epsilon where the phi angle is zero and here an integral goes from epsilon to r where the phi is zero so these two cancel each other out if you add them up and that's what we're going to do we're going to add g2 this curve plus this curve we're going to add them up and these two will disappear so everything disappears except l1 and l3 so those are the only ones we have to focus on okay and that's what we do here so we have l1 and l3 are left those are the only two integrals that are left in this whole spiel <coughs> and now we can fill out again the values uh, of this function and we're going to say okay we make it again e to the power alpha minus one log c absolute plus i arc c on both sides divided over c squared minus one now in l1 territory we know it's minus three over two times pi as an angle for your arc c because that's what c is over here 
you can see that and you also fill that out here e to the minus 3 2 pi i squared times x because that's what c is on this part of the contour minus 1 and you do that here also in your dc because c is this value here and you do the same for l3 but now with l3 you fill out pi over 2 a plus right there z is e to the pi over 2i times x so if, if you fill that out for c here for c here and for c there what you get is the following this minus 3 2 pi i like e to the pi 2 over i this gives you i right this is an i here if you quadratize that that's a minus 1 so you get a minus minus and that gives you an x squared plus 1 again so there you have it right that's the wick the famous wick rotation you can do to uh, to calculate an integral so if you work this this one out here in this case this is fairly simple so it's, this is again uh, resulting with this minus 1 and this i to the 3 2 uh, pi gives you a minus sign <coughs> plus this one that gives you an overall minus sign times i to the minus 3 2 pi alpha i over here if you multiply this with this one it gives you that minus over there and it gives you the integral we're interested in which we will later call t again and if you do the same here and you work it out you get an e plus pi over 2 alpha i times that integral you're interested in okay and i rewrote this out one more time over here now if you look carefully there's a sign in there so you take out e to the minus pi over 2 alpha i and then you can fold it into a sign over here you divide by 2i then you have to multiply by an extra 2i okay plus that integral here uh, plus the integral we're interested in so that gives you 2 e to the power minus pi over 2 alpha i times t times i times sine pi alpha and that's for the left hand side so now we evaluated both contours and the sum of those is this result so now we can calculate the residues and as I stated before since the residue is on the contour one of the residues is on the contour here uh, we have to do a pi i instead of a 2 pi i so the total residues on G which are the sum of the residues on G1 plus G2 plus some of the residues that are on the contour itself that's a pi i times the residues of g1 plus g2 and that gives you essentially three residues there's one inside here for the top right which is 2 pi i times the residue of g1 here where fc equals z minus 1 that's that residue then there is a pi i residue on here at z equals 1 that we have to add and there is a pi i residue on g2 on this piece also at c equals 1 okay there so if you add those up you get 2 pi i times again you have to work this one out e to the alpha minus 1 log minus 1 minus i pi that's what that residue is minus 1 minus 1 plus the pi i residue in 1 so you get a 1 plus 1 here and the pi i residue of the g2 portion also in one you also get a one plus one here okay if you add those all up you get minus pi i e to the minus alpha minus one pi i plus pi i you can take pi i out and you get e minus alpha pi i plus one over here you can rewrite that slightly into a cosine half angle again plus a term that comes out over here and obviously you try to massage it in such a way that you can uh, eliminate the, uh, the e to the minus pi over 2 alpha i that you calculated before right you want to get rid of that so the result for the residues is now 2 pi i e to the minus pi over 2 alpha i times cosine pi over 2 times alpha okay because this is a cosine so there you have it so now you're gonna match up the left and the right hand side and that should give you the t so the t here equals 
the integral from zero to infinity in its limit, right? The t was between epsilon and r, but you now go to the limit epsilon to zero r to infinity, and that gives you exactly the integral you're interested in. And that is now cosine, of course, pi over two alpha over here, defined it by sine here, times pi, and the rest falls away, the two falls away, the i's fall away, the e to the power fall, falls away here. So you're left with this, and you can rewrite that again into pi over two sine pi over two alpha. And that is exactly the result we had before for the integral, as it should be, but now calculated in a very different way with two contours instead of one contour and kind of unusual cuts. Usually you cut on the, uh, on the real axis if you can, but you can cut anywhere. You can take all kinds of interesting contours and cuts to come up with your result, but you have to do it in a clever way. Okay, I hope this gives you a little bit of insight in how to work with contours. Uh, so you can also apply it to different integrals, which are not uh, that common and hard to calculate in conventional ways. Okay, I think this is a great place to stop. If you like this video, please subscribe and please like, and I'll see you in the next one.